Welcome, graduating students, non-graduating students, alumni, parents, and others who are joining us today. Let me start by extending some big congratulations to the graduating class of 2020. Even in these difficult times, today is a day to acknowledge your accomplishments, and I hope you will enjoy the day's festivities that we have in store for you. Now, I would like to share a brief one minute video from alumnus Cindy Forbes, President of the Board of Governors and EVP and Chief Analytics Officer at Manulife as she welcomes the class of 2020 to a very elite club. Congratulations to the math class of 2020. You've made it, achieved your goal through the application of your intellect, your passion, your resilience, your persistence. You are graduating at a time of uncertainty and change and I have every confidence that you will succeed, in fact, excel at whatever path you choose. Your Waterloo experience equips you uniquely, as it did me 41 years ago, a graduate of the faculty's seventh class, to take on whatever challenges come your way and to take advantage of the opportunity to reshape the world as we know it. I wish you every success and welcome you to the Alumni Club one that I invite you to be an active participant in and to give back to the school that has given you such a strong foundation. Congratulations to the class of 2020. Now I'd like to introduce our class of 2020 moderator, Jose Aviles. Jose's career has been highly nonlinear. He started off as a medical student at Universidad Piruana Cayetano Heredia, where he spent most of his time as a research trainee in epidemiology. When he realized that he enjoyed his statistics textbook far more than his physiology textbooks, he decided to transfer to the University of Waterloo to study mathematics. Over time, he was seduced by the lure of three areas within math, financial machine learning, time series analysis, and stochastic analysis. As part of the co-op program, he entered at FLIP, Capital One, Oliver Wyman, and more recently at GWN Capital Management, where he currently works. His post-pandemic plans include getting a PhD in math, becoming mildly skilled at the piano, and learning how to make the Premier's cheesecake recipe. I'll hand it over to you now, Jose. Thank you, Jenny. It is my honor and privilege to be here this morning having a conversation with the President and CEO of RBC, Dave Mackay. Thank you all for taking the time to be here with us. As president and CEO of RBC, Dave Magai is reimagining the future of banking, helping RBC's clients thrive and communities prosper. Since joining the bank as a computer programmer in 1983, he has been committed to building innovation in the company's DNA. Dave is a strong advocate for helping young prepare uh, for the future of work through RBC Future Launch, a $500 million commitment to help young people succeed in the changing economy. They hold a Bachelor of Mathematics and an Honorary Doctor of Mathematics degree from the University of Waterloo. So, Dave, how are you doing today? Hope everyone's doing well, and thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to speak to you today. I'm looking forward uh, to your questions. And it was uh, Cindy Forbes uh, opened up off the top. A sincere congratulations to everyone for uh, the hard work that's gone into and the success you've had in, in graduating from a fantastic program, one that I know We'll talk about a little bit that will position you very well for the future. That's wonderful, Dave. Thank you. So my first question to you uh, can't help skipping over the, the current scenario the world is facing. Uh, but let's go back in time a bit. Over your career at RBC, you've experienced the ebbs and flows of markets. Uh, you've lived through Black Monday, the 97 Asian crash, the dot-com bubble, the Great Recession, and what now some people are calling the, the Great Lockdown. For this graduating class, the four, first four events are just some exercise in financial history, but the latter and most recent one is, is one that poses real and complex challenges, some of which may actually just be intractable. Tell us, in a world experiencing crisis and challenges during a current context, what do you see as the role of business and you as a senior leader in the country? It's an important question because I think you know, I've been through two crises myself, the financial crisis as a senior leader in the organization I ran that about half of RBC, the Canadian Retail Bank, when we had the 2008 financial crisis and overall, uh, you know, then through the pandemic crisis that we're currently, uh, you know, probably two thirds of the way through. 
and the role of business has changed. I think we were out ahead of this at RBC, but certainly I view the role of business to be a multi-stakeholder approach. You're, you're responsible to your communities, you're responsible to your clients, you're responsible to your employees, and you're responsible to your shareholders. And I think that dialogue around the world has certainly shifted. If you go back a number of years, the World Economic Forum was pushing this agenda, but certainly this move from being viewing the role of a CEO and viewing the role of a board and of a, a private public sector company to be solely focused on the maximization of shareholder profit is a concept that's gone you know far you know far behind us. I think we we have to earn our social license to do business. I think that has been a significant change. And we've been on this journey at RBC now for the better part of seven or eight years, as you referenced thought. In your introduction, we, we stated our purpose of helping our clients thrive and communities prosper. And we really believed that we were only as strong as the health of our communities. And that wasn't just about making uh, donations to our communities, but that we had to be active members in that community. And therefore, a healthy, prosperous community was something that all 85,000 employees, not just the CEO, had to make sure happened. So I think from our perspective, this multi-stakeholder capitalism, as we're coining it today, the, you know, the terms change, is so critical in balancing the needs. And that's the role that business can play in society. And, and when you truly buy into the fact that you have to earn your social license to do business and you have to be active in your communities and for the health of your community, then your perspective on the role a CEO has to play in being more vocal to the how society has to change. You know, CEOs used to be afraid to, to speak out against government policy, against issues that weren't being managed for fear of reprisal, for fear of customer lashback. And you know, you know, your your shareholders would say, why are you why are you taking these risks? Now shareholders are pushing management to say, why aren't you more vocal about what's going on in your community? So I think we've come a long way from the perspective of the role that a company plays in society. Uh, CEOs tend to have more tenure on, on average than our political leaders. They have more experience leading, making decisions, framing decisions, and therefore can play a critical role in a crisis in partnership with government and helping design policy. So I think from that perspective, you've seen a real evolution that will, in your, in your generation, as you take over the leadership of our country and of, of whatever country, I think there's 44 different countries represented in the graduating class. I think that's just incredible wherever you're going back to whether what country you're going to work in i think the, the role that you're going to play is going to be an increased impact from uh the private sector do you feel there was a pivotal point in time where this uh, relationship between business ceos and, and government changed you know i think it's a great question i think technology's had a big role to play i think the advent of you know, social media, the ease of communicating, the ease of, of sharing opinions, of, of sharing information, of getting into chat rooms. I think the whole social media platforms have forced all levels of organizations from governments to not-for-profits to corporations to recognize that uh, the, the perspective of your brand, of your company, you know, how society views you can be shaped by a few events and therefore your role in society becomes even more critical. So I think one, one you know, element of change to your reference was technology has changed that. Before communication means it was very hard to communicate what's going on in society. Today, everybody knows in an instant what's going on. And therefore I think companies and governments have realized that we have to manage very differently. So part of it was technology Part of it's just an evolving nature of leadership and evolving roles and responsibility. I think society grows and matures with each generation. Your generation will, will look back at some of the things we do and scratch your head and say, can't believe they thought that back then. So it's, it's about learning and it's about a journey. And I think each generation, you know, successful societies, the next generation stands on the shoulder of the previous generation and, and builds on that platform. That's great. That's very thoughtful, Dave. Thank you. Um, again, let's, let's go back in time a bit. In 2018, you said the world is at historic crossroads with the largest generation of young people coming into the workforce at the same time as the fourth industrial revolution. 
you also said that my generation is, is the one that's best equipped to handle this revolution. So my question to you is what, if any, skill sets and traits of my generation do you think will position us uniquely to handle the challenge of a, of a post-COVID world? Yeah, I, I think there's a, a couple of things that you're uniquely suited for. And honestly, there's a couple of gaps that I see that, that worry me that you're going to have to work on. So let's, let's handle both sides of that. Uh, you know, the first side, obviously, as I see leaders in society, leaders in my own company, what, what differentiates success? Well, a big part of it is how do you frame the decision that you, you need to make? How do you frame the outcomes that you're looking for? Then who leads the most creative process to find the solution and the path to that outcome you want? And I think for your generation, the skills, and particularly the, this graduating class, coming out with the, the skills that you're developing around the facilitation with data, the facilitation with artificial intelligence, robotic process automation, blockchain, those technologies will rebuild our society. And therefore your ability to creatively find new paths and new solutions using technology, using data, you know, the insights that AI can have and predictability and you know, that mass data application where we just didn't have the power of that data in the first place, we didn't collect it in my, most of my generation we are now, but we didn't have the tools of the computing power, the AI, artificial intelligence capability to find different correlations of the data in different predictability way. All that insight you're gonna to have to harness as a generation and use that to, to make better decisions, whatever walk of life, whether it's in the government, in the public sector, or private sector, uh, not-for-profit, entrepreneurialism, you're gonna to have to lever that. So I think coming out of this program, you're, you're best suited to be able to frame decisions, put analytics together and come up with more original and innovative solutions because that's how the world changes. Who can come up with a more innovative solution to a problem or to an opportunity and, and frame the whole context differently? I think you know, your co-op experience positions you well for that. That uh, you know, I noticed yourself, Jose, had four different co-op experiences, it looks like in at least very different industries and, and touch points. Uh, different companies, different, uh, you know, different management styles in each of the cultures in each of those companies. So how you frame and how you innovate, I think, is a real skill that you're going to bring to the table where many of your peers and other programs won't have that facilitation. The other key skill that all CEOs worry about the next generation, and in particular STEM skill graduates, is the soft skills. I think we're in a, you know, soft skills become more and more important. We call them power skills now, and that's communication and that's leadership. Communication has never been more important, particularly as you flatten organizations. Technology has allowed us to do that, but communication skills one-on-one, -on -one, communi written communication skills have to get better, uh, you know, verbal communication skills. You can't underestimate how important it is to be able to communicate your ideas, convince other people's influence in multiple channels in written format and oral format. It's so important. And so I encourage you to, to, to work on those, to practice those, to practice building relationships. You know, build it, we're, we're exploring building relationships in a digital world. Uh, we have 1400 students uh, who started digitally for the first time. We normally bring them into big auditoriums and we talk to them. They, they disperse throughout our, our buildings. And, they, they see how we work and we have them 100% online. We, we've kept all our summer students and we plan on continuing to hire our co-ops the way we've hired in the past. So I think that that's a real skill that I think the next generation is going to have to really pay attention to and you can't underestimate how important it is. That's, that's great. I certainly, certainly had a hard time adapting to, to this remote challenge. Uh, but let's, let's circle back to, to something, an interesting point you mentioned. Uh, perhaps the amount of data that's being generated is, is far, far larger than the number of graduates uh, we're producing here at Waterloo. But, you know, everyone in the audience here has, has the technical skills to, to look through the data and, and come, up, come up with the right insights. Um, but something, a big, a big question that, you, that rises everywhere in the industry, from startups to big enterprises, is, is about you know, the ethical use of AI and, 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 and mass, mass data. I was wondering if, if, if you can share any thoughts on that. Yeah, we've certainly you know, supported the funding uh, of the ethical use of AI. And our Borealis AI group was one of the larger 
private sector uh, artificial intelligence capability. We have over 100 PhDs working for us in the field of uh, applied AI for the most part, uh, some core research going on as well. Um, it's absolutely critical. I think we're on a journey, right? We're, le we're just learning the power of the learning power of these machine and machine learning, different disciplines of AI, obviously reinforcement learning is a big field that uh, we're very interested in and, and putting a lot of capital into. Uh, so as we think about the, the journey we're on, we're, we're learning. We don't have all the solutions about where the boundaries are on AI. You know, obviously, privacy is one that's front and center right now. And as we talk about trying to manage the health impacts of COVID, COVID and, the, and the recontagion risk, you know, there's a reluctance on the part of government uh, in particular, but a reluctance of individuals to have tracing apps on their phone or on their iPads or whatever mobility device they're using for fear of privacy. Yet the application of AI in mobility and protecting the health of uh, our citizens couldn't be more powerful. So you know, where are the, there's a boundary that we're exploring today in real time, and we're having ongoing discussions. I have discussions with federal government, with provincial government, with municipal governments around the need to trace and test to protect society, yet there's a real fear. So we are pushing that boundary today. You know, there's not, they're not gonna be mandatory, but if we don't get a certain threshold of usage on these tracing apps, uh, then we are you know, undermanned as far as uh, you know, going after and, and stamping out the recontagion fires that are going to appear in our society before they become another pandemic risk. So you know, certainly exploring the boundaries of our society. And, and that is something that we're going to have to debate as a society. And I don't have all the answers because this is new territory for me too. And therefore, it, it, it takes multiple generations, I think, to sit down. And it will probably be like peeling an onion. We'll have a certain view of, this point in time and that you will change over time. Think about how much we've learned about the COVID-19 uh, virus. Now we thought in early March, I mean I was sat down with all the best epidemics uh, researchers, I sat down with uh, you know, most of the, the key thinkers in the medical community and we didn't think that this virus was, con was contagious in an, in an asymptomatic form and how wrong we were that this is, was highly contagious in an asymptomatic form and therefore we would have pursued very different strategies, health strategies, had we thought that up front. So I think AI is a little bit along the same vein, but we will uh, we'll be learning as we go and we're gonna test the boundaries and just like we're doing now around tracing apps, we're gonna debate that as a society and it's a healthy debate. That's that's entirely true. I think I think if this pandemic had happened ten years ago, the the world would be a very very different place. And and just the amount of data we have right now, and, and people capable of of understanding and communicating that data is has just made a, a crucial difference. Um, let's talk about the, the co-op program at Waterloo for a second. Uh, you've, show, you've shared many times that you chose Waterloo because of the Pacoa program, and you've been one of, uh, one of its most passionate advocates since its inception. And, you know, I myself and many of my classmates here today, have, we've all experienced the benefits of, of the program. Um, but at this time, many, of, many other classmates, many who aren't yet graduating, uh, may face the reality that, that there really isn't any, any placement available for them. So tell me, what role can alumni play to champion work integrated learning programs and the opportunities they bring to future generations? Yeah, and I can empathize with the frustration after four or five years of hard work, depending on how many co-op work terms you did, and you're all ready to go, you've, you've worked hard, you're ready to launch your career and, and make money and, and, and you know, live, live the next phase of your life. It's incredibly frustrating to be, de de not derailed, but slowed down uh, you know, early in your career. And uh, so I can empathize with that. My own children are going through a very similar uh, feeling right now, one who had just graduated uh, from her uh, STEM program. Um, what I can say is that you know, the economy is returning more quickly than I would have thought. Uh, we probably regained 50% of the lost economic activity that and it's peaked down in April. Now kind of getting towards mid-June, we're probably back halfway. 
this economy will, will slow down in its recovery, but the skills that you've developed will not remain on the sidelines. So if you find yourself underutilized or underemployed right now, I wouldn't worry. I would, I would use this opportunity to reflect, to learn something, to do something different that you might not have time to do when you start to get busy with your careers. But I would feel comfortable in the skills you've gained in this program and the capabilities that, and, and knowing what we just talked about, about where this world's going and, and the types of problems we're gonna have to solve and the skills we're gonna need to solve them, you are front and center in a society that's gonna shift pretty significantly in the skills that needs to be successful. So I would view this as a very temporary slowdown. There'll be some people in our society that will get derailed by this pandemic and a very slow recovery in a number of service industries are gonna take quite some time and that's gonna be difficult for our society. But as, as young graduates, I know how frustrated you are, but it's temporary. You have my generation that will be retiring soon. I see an accelerated opportunity to take leadership roles within society, whether it's an entrepreneurial role, government role, corporate role. There's gonna be a gap in leadership as the, the boomers retire in a, in a large mass. So I think from that perspective, we see gaps behind us and opportunities. So I know it's gonna take a, a little bit of time, but in the context of my career, your careers are gonna accelerate much faster then I had the opportunity to make significant decisions at RBC when I joined as a young co-op student uh, in my early 20s. What we are doing though, as far as what can leaders do, I chair an organization called the Business Higher Education Roundtable. It has the top universities and college presidents at the table along with the top CEOs. And we've been meeting for the last three years now. We've made a commitment to Canada to create 150,000 new co-op jobs on top of the 150,000 that are roughly there today. We received significant funding from the Canadian government to structure our organization, so we're out there and we were ready to launch a number of programs uh, in this spring. Uh, COVID-19 has derailed that a little bit, so we're pausing slightly, but I can tell you that we are gonna go back at this early in the fall uh, to create those roles. So over the short term, uh, companies like RBC have committed to retaining all of their co-ops and all their summer students, which we've done, as I said, over 1,400 started on, on May 2nd. This year, we'll continue to hire our co-ops. We're encouraging other leaders. And I, I think the economy for your skills will bounce back a lot quicker. And the government has come up, uh, Jose, as you referenced, with a number of programs this summer to help engage uh, our undergraduate uh, and graduate students and meaningful research and work. So uh, you know, keep looking for it out there, but I think from that perspective, we've come together nicely. But I know it's frustrating, but big things are ahead for this class, I think. Thanks, Dave. Uh, certainly making more jobs available helps people who are looking for them. I, I feel lucky myself to have one at the moment. Uh, but one of our audience members uh, wants to know, uh, beyond creating new jobs, is there something else companies can do to help new, new graduates? Certainly one of them, you know, funding research in universities as we think about, and you know, you know, part of the challenge that all countries are gonna go through is rethinking some of their core supply chains. We're gonna need government policy, and active government policy to encourage risk capital to come into the country or invest within the country to create new supply chains and manufacturing, certainly around uh, PPE, around healthcare outcomes, you know, we're, going to, we're looking at our society differently and our reliance on trade will, will come down a bit. I think it's still important to maintain large global trade because it would be highly inflationary and the world would be worse off without it. But we're, we're starting to question some of our long-term trade partnerships as a country. And I think that's going to create a, you know, real opportunity. So we're, but we can't just do it the way we've always done it. If we're going to bring certain manufacturing capabilities back to our country, we're gonna to have to do it differently. And it's gonna require different technology, different systems. We can lever our energy resources, we can lever our water resources, land and transportation infrastructure. But it's gonna require really, really smart people who wanna take risk and innovate. And I think that's where you come in. So I think there's an opportunity for us to fund banks to encourage that, to pension funds to set up investment funds to accelerate that. So there's a number of things that companies can do, I think, to create opportunity and research 
uh, and in uh, and, and new jobs. So I think that's how I would kind of approach that question. There's a lot going on, a lot that will go on that will significantly transform opportunities and roles within our society. Yeah, certainly adapting to changing economic landscape is 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 going to be a challenge, but also, you know, the uncertainty of it, I, I think, can be can be exciting. Uh, and, and I feel the, the graduating class shares that sentiment. I can imagine the anxiety everyone's feeling, but we're well on our way to to recovery. And I think the health outcomes are a lot better than they were kind of three weeks ago when I was getting frustrated myself that they weren't coming down fast enough. The economic recoveries are heard from the Bank of Canada governor, and you know the numbers that I see are is quite a significant, uh, you know, sharp bend back that we were hoping to see. So all in, it it, it feels quite dire listening to the news. So what what can you do? L listen less to CNN, and go <laughs> read a book, paint, run, uh, write a book, write music, uh, learn a new skill, but don't listen to CNN. Do you have any skills you would, you would tell your your you know your twenty year old self uh, to learn if 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 that person were facing the pandemic right now? You know, I've uh, I've always played guitar, and I and I learned how to play guitar at Waterloo, and you know, I, it was one of my good friends uh, who had I was in I guess the the V what is it V V one V two dorm I guess the uh, the zoo where all the first years go was running out of money at the end of our first year. Uh, so he sold me his, his electric guitar in first year. And I picked it up then and I, and I had a real passion for it. So I just did a, uh, a Zoom video with uh, astronaut Chris Hadfield, who's very famous for having brought his guitar onto the space station and uh, played Space Oddity, which if you look at it on YouTube, has been downloaded, I think, close to 50 million times right now. So Chris challenged me to play Space Oddity with him. Uh, so I have committed uh, publicly to play Space Oddity with Chris sometime in the near future. So <laughs> I am back at the guitar, uh, which links me all the way back to my first year in, uh, in V2 Waterloo. That's wonderful. Do you have any, any favorite guitarists, any big influences in your playing? I'm a big Pearl Jam fan. I love Pearl Jam. So Mike McCready, I love obviously Eric Clapton and uh, Jimmy Page back to you know, my generation and uh, Led Zeppelin. And uh, you know, so I, I love playing electric, but I'm playing a lot of, a lot of acoustic right now, uh, just largely because some of the David Bowie stuff's acoustic and I've got a, you know, I bought a bunch of guitars at home. So I, it's very cathartic to come home from a stressful post COVID day running the bank and to go down to the basement and, and pick up the guitar. It, uh, it, it's a great way to finish the day. Yeah, music has a, that power to just... Yeah, and you picked up the piano, it sounds like, right? It, you can lose yourself in it, which you need to do every once in a while. Yeah, I guess I was being a bit coy. I, I, I picked it up at, at Waterloo, just, I guess, just like you and the guitar. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's at least great for me. Uh, but no, that's a, that's a great list of, of musicians, so, so I definitely approve. Um, <laughs> Uh, we have another question here. Um, back in your 2018 convocation address, you challenged the, the graduating class to never stop learning. How, how has this simple piece of advice helped you in, in your career? And what are you currently focusing on your own personal learning journey right now? That's a great question. You know, I, curiosity is one of the, the core aptitudes that we look for in our leadership team constantly learning, asking the right questions, how do you find answers? The curiosity is so important to success in our society and particularly, I think, the next generation. You know, for me, I'm, I'm constantly learning, but I go back to, you know, what did I do that differentiated myself within an organization of 85,000 people? How do you work your way through a company over 25 years and, and get to the top of the largest company in this country, one of the largest companies in the world? And for me, I always approached it that for every role I took, my father was a, an entrepreneur. He ran a small business in Montreal. I watched how he ran his company and I never wanted to be part of it, um, but I, wa I watched how he ran it. And I, I took an approach that an entrepreneur would say, every role that I took, I tried to learn three roles. I had to be really good at my own role, but I also watched how my boss did his or her job. And, uh, and obviously the challenges they had, how could I make them more successful? 
So I always felt if I wanted to move up, I had to learn my boss's job. And I always picked, if I ever got lateraled into one of my peers' jobs, I should probably learn their job too. So I would spend time looking at their challenges, how could I help them with, take them out to lunch, understand what they're working on. So if you just look at the exponential impact of trying to learn three jobs every a year and a half to two years, you accelerate your knowledge of business, you accelerate your knowledge of leadership, of the organization in particular that you're working for. And that has been one of the secret sauces for me. Every time I got promoted, often it was to manage my peers. Everyone says, it looks like you've been doing the job for two years already. So well, I've been training my mind to do the job for the last two years. So I'm mentally ready uh, to do that. So that has been kind of one of the success factors. The second is I've always had a huge curiosity around technology, not technology for technology's sake. I'm often, you know, classified as a quant because of my background by other non-quants. I'm classified as a computer guy. And I said, I'm not really a computer guy. I didn't build a lot of the systems. I started as a, as a co-op coder for RBC. I coded uh, Assembler and COBOL. You can believe it or not, we still have COBOL systems in the bank. I don't think I was very good at it because they came to me and they said, we see you more on the management side of the business. So I, I left the, a, the computer side of the business, the system side. But it was the systems design thinking, I think I picked up at Waterloo and all the systems design courses that really, really has made me successful in, in seeing how systems hold together and challenging systems and building new systems. So I think from that perspective, but to your question, what's challenged me in the short term, I've had to learn about AI and how you're going to apply it in the organization. I've had to learn about blockchain where its strengths and weaknesses are, help the organization set up, start applying blockchain to different solutions robotic process automation. So there's been a number of technologies that you haven't heard about that have you know, started and stopped. But certainly, you know, how does an organization use AI from reinforcement learning to you know, different forms of applied AI uh, in its organization? So that's been a real challenge for a CEO, all CEOs, and some have done it well and some haven't. Uh, so, that, so there's always something to learn in a society that's changing as fast and just you know, the current issues around healthcare. I never thought I'd have to learn as much about our healthcare system as I've had to learn over the last three months. And, you know, how does it affect our organization? How does it affect our customers? And how do I protect our employees from the risks of this pandemic yet serve our customers? So you're always on a learning curve in the world's throwing challenges. And I think the most, you know, the current challenge, the, the current challenge in the last week is around racism discrimination and uh, lack of inclusion. Our organization, you know, interestingly was ranked last year as the second most diverse and inclusive company in the world, in the world by, by Bloomberg. And, you know, we were really proud of that. I think it was uh, PwC was ranked number one, and a bunch of American firms, the only Canadian firm in the top, I think 50. And we would normally take that and say, well, we pretty much figured out how to be an inclusive organization, inclusive culture, yet, you know, with, with the, the tragic loss, Mr. Foy's life in, uh, in Minneapolis and, and the outpouring of anger and frustration from the community, I had a number of emails from, from leaders across the world, particularly in Canada, United States, saying, you know, we're not perfect either as an organization. And here's been, this has been my experience in the organization. I, I was really taken aback. I say, wow, I never thought in our own culture that we would, we would have employees who are still experiencing discrimination and particularly racism. And therefore, you know, I have to kind of relearn you know, why it's happening and what I need to do about it. And you're, you're asking questions and you've got to, you've got to listen and form new perspectives because the old paradigms weren't right. And sometimes you fall into a trap saying, we've kind of, we figured this out. We've, then someone tells you, no, you haven't figured it out because it's lying under the surface and you don't see it as a leader. And therefore you have to stop and go back. And I think, you know, for the last week, that's been, you know, unfortunately a, a learning for me in our society, but also even in a company that gets ranked as the second best in the world, I still have my own challenges to deal with. Do you feel optimistic about where things are going in that regard? Um, I'm worried. I'm worried honestly because we tend to say a lot of the right things in the, in the epicenter of the crisis when the anger is is in front of us and 
the outpouring of anger and the physicality of that anger manifesting itself in, in, in their communities and the looting and the demonstrations. It's, a, it's an outpouring of anger and saying, solve this. And this is the only way I can express that anger. And this is the only time I get any attention is when I manifest this anger physically in our society. And then when it goes away, then we tend to get back to our lives and we don't actually solve the problem. So my worry is that every CEO has come out with the standard rhetoric denouncing this. Of course, we're going to denounce it. But what are we really doing about it? Who's going back into their organization and asking really tough questions to say, we have racism in our, in our own company, in our own community. And why is that? And I'm on a learning mission. I, I'm trying to figure out what is, what is at the root of this? What fear do we have that we can't integrate better? And you know, one of the conclusions I've come to in the last week that I'm starting to share with other CEOs, it, it's a fear of a zero sum game that the people in our society that have are at fear of losing what they have if they're more inclusive and someone's gonna take it from them. So I have it and now you have it, so I don't have it. And therefore it's a threat. And because it's a threat, I'm not gonna do anything to perpetuate change. And at the root of that, we have to get society to believe and leaders, we have to do this. And then back to your first question, what can business do? Business can lead on this probably better than government but we, because we can make actual change in society. We have to get people to the perspective, society to the perspective that everybody wins. That it's, this is not zero sum, that all, all parts of our society can win, can have, can have a job, can have a future, can have a house, can have a, have a place where they feel safe. And we have to break through this paradigm. So I, I worry that We'll just fall back to the same old way we've done so many other times. And you know, I, I was on a call last night again with some fellow CEOs, and we committed to say we just can't let this tragic death go to. We have to make something from this, right? It would be, it's a, it's hard enough losing a citizen the way we have in uh, Mr. Floyd, but what we can do is make sure the world changes because of what happened. But it's not easy. It's definitely not easy. Uh, you know, it, it, dreaming dreaming of a more egalitarian society is, is certainly a, a lofty dream. Um, and, I, and I hope one that's within both our lifetimes. Um, and, you know, I, I think we all want to thank you for, uh, for making the effort to enact change. I think that's very important. Um, you know, it, 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 is, it is time that, that things get better. It is. We have to. We can't fail. And your generation is going to have to, to accelerate that change. That you know, We've made a lot of progress, but it's not enough. And we've left a fair bit of work to do. Yeah, I, I, I commit to it. I will definitely commit to, to ensuring that that change happens. Um, I, I, I want to, you know, I, I want to drift a, a little, little bit away from, from, from this somber note uh, and, and want to go back to, to your leadership at, at RBC. Um, you've, you've been at the front lines of, of this economic crisis and, and the previous one uh, back in 2008. Um, what have you learned from leading your, your 85,000 colleagues uh, during these types of, of crises? How, how do you support your clients uh, how, how do you perform uh, in, in business? All these things while at the same time taking care of your own health and, and well-being. There's a couple of things. You know, one important learning from leadership in general, but becomes quite acute in a crisis, is the importance of culture. And you probably took you know, behavioral courses and culture and you, you slept through it. And you said, what a bunch of mumbo jumbo. Um, but culture is real and employees feel culture customers feel culture and communities feel the culture and you know how do i define culture culture to me is simple what does an employee do when no one's looking what decision do they make what inner voice guides an employee when they're in front of a customer and they're faced with a decision and there's no one to tell them what to do or what what decision does a leader make about people or about uh, 
business decisions, investment decisions when no one else is looking. So culture is that inner voice to say what's right and what's wrong in the context of your purpose, in the context of how you conduct yourself in society. And companies, as you've seen, Jose, as you worked for many different cultures, one I can see from you know, Capital One to uh, more of a hedge fund culture, are very different. And they, they go about their business differently. So I, I think from that perspective, I've learned that when you get into a crisis and p- things move faster, then you rely on culture more. And I always say you cannot fake culture. Culture is really ingrained in people. You can fake things for a day, but you can't fake things over weeks and months and your culture really comes to the fore because people have to make decisions quickly, sometimes without guidance. And what, what inner voice do they lean on to make the right decision according to how this company wants to conduct itself or this organization? So you know, I've learned that investing in culture upfront has paid significantly for us over time. You know, the culture and how we do business, I always emphasize with all our leaders from, the, from top to bottom that we're measured on what we do and how we do it. And we have equal you know, metrics around the how. How are you perceived in society? How does community feel about us? How do customers feel about us? It's not about how many products we sell all the time or the revenue, but how the customer feels about us afterwards is, is more important. Because if you take a perspective that you're, you want, we're, we celebrated our 150th anniversary as a company last year, we plan to be here for another 150 years or more. And if you take that perspective, you're making decisions for the long term and culture and how you do business is at the root of it all. You know, for me, you're, you're all gonna have to make sacrifices. There's no such thing as having it all because there's not enough time in the day. We're all bound by, as Bill Gates said, that 24 hour clock. And one caution, I say, you have to take care of yourself. This is a marathon. This is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And I've seen a number of, of senior leaders, very smart, who, or of the mindset that they only needed four hours sleep to function. And they were pretty strong in that you know, cognitively, they could do better on four hours sleep and they could spend 18 hours in the office, two hours at home and sleep four hours and back. And they outworked their peers, they got ahead because they outworked them, but far too many of them succumbed to long-term chronic illness, particularly cancer. And your body can't withstand that. It can withstand it for a short term, but you have to take care of yourself. You have to find outlets to recharge yourself mentally and emotionally, and you have to take the time to recharge yourself physically. Because with tech, you know, with technology and the, the hey, healthcare is going, you're going to all live to be over 100 years old, and you need both mental faculties and physical faculties to 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 keep going. So you're going to you're, you're you have the opportunity to play a longer term game than my generation, which is, you know, the average age thankfully has gone from the seventies to the eighties, but you have a, a hundred years ahead of you. So I think from that perspective, even you know, more need to plan for physical, mental and financial health going forward. You know, long-term planning com- comes in for, for everyone, you know, both in business uh, and uh, in the recent graduating class. In particular, one of our audience members wants to know uh, if you have to give one one piece of advice, what would be your top piece of, of advice you would give a recent a recent graduate who's planning uh, th- the next chapter in their lives? Yep, dream. Don't be afraid to dream. You know, dream big. People might not believe it, but when I was a co-op student coding in, in Montreal in the international business systems, I was helping build. Uh, you know, products for our, our European operation when I first started coding. I looked around that organization. I looked around that floor. I really liked the people I was working with. I, I, I love the concept of banking and helping people in a global operation involved in every aspect of the economy and society. I started dreaming. Oh, could I be CEO? I was 18 years old. And there's probably 80,000 people ahead of me in that line at the time. I never told anybody. And then I joined full time and I always dreamt, you know, could I, could I be CEO? And I always had this, you know, message in the back of my mind, never told anybody, why not me? Why not me? Until someone tells you it's not you, 
then I think you should always assume, why not me? And one thing I've learned leading in the organization that's helped the organization and helped me progress through the organization is I always started with bold objectives. I always said I would like our division or our business to be recognized as the best in the world at what they do. And people look at me and like, what are you talking about? And I go, not best in Canada, we're a small country. How do you set the benchmark that we will have to be best in the world at what we do? And what does that look like? Can you break it down for people? And then I would say, okay, so how much did we grow last year? What were our objectives? Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna double those. So I always set an objective of trying to double the business or at least grow at 50%. And I never forget the first time I stood up as an executive head of the credit card business and we had been struggling a little bit. We had some good ideas, but we had lost one of our big partners who had defaulted in, in uh, Canadian Airlines. And they were acquired by Air Canada and we lost our, our largest product. And I said, you know, we're going to double it in three years. We're going to double this business. And I remember a, a lot of senior people in the back row snickering and laughing and said he's out of his mind. And I said, but here's how we're gonna do it. I don't know all the ways we're gonna do it, but we're gonna work and we're going to break this down into pieces and we're gonna to work towards that. And guess what? We did it in two years. We doubled the business in two years. We launched seven products, which was what we would normally do in five or six years. We, five of them failed. Two of them were really good. And one of them, is now the number one card in the country, Avion, uh, in our country with probably 10% market share. So I think of the overall spend and makes probably $400 million a year. So I think from that perspective, setting big goals, you know, three years ago, we went and I encouraged my leaders, we're gonna declare a, a, a big growth opportunity for our business publicly. We're going to go to our shareholders. We're going to have investor day. You can go back and look at our investor day. We've told the market we're going to acquire 5 million new relationships in a country of 35 million people. And, you know, everyone went, well, you're kidding me. But then we broke it down. We spent the next three hours, as you'll see in that presentation, breaking it down. And if you look at our results that we just released a week and a half ago, we have never been so far ahead of our competitors in this business, which is half of the organization, the Retail Bank in Canada. We were 50% ahead of the closest competitor, which was TD Bank. They had always been on our tail at 10% difference. So throughout my career, from the first time I was an executive to most recently, uh, oh, three years ago, to everything we do, if you don't set a bold objective, then you have no chance of getting to someplace really special. Even if you, even if you get halfway there, you're gonna learn it. And the other learning is just start. You don't have to have it all figured out. You have to have a general idea of where you need to get to and then let the team figure out how to get there. And the part of my success was I didn't always have the best way to get there, but I engaged the team and the team often figured out, say, that's a good idea, Dave, but we think this is a better way to do it. And I think about, yeah, you're right. That is a better way to do it. Go, go do it. So that, that whole iterative process of thinking and creating and challenging starts with a bold objective where you just can't do the same old, same old. I think that's how we're reimagining the bank. I've asked every business to redefine the business they're in. So I said, we're not in the mortgage business anymore. What business are we in? We're in the, we're in the shelter facilitation business. Sounds crazy, but when you change the whole concept, what does shelter facilitation mean? Well, figure it out. People are renting their homes. People are buying part ownership of homes. There's gonna be third party equity in homes. The mortgage concept of I give you a mortgage, you buy a home, is, an, is a dated concept. Think about more broadly what services we can bring to someone who wants to you know, provide shelter for themselves and their family. We help fix your home, we help, help lease your home, we help buy it, we help sell it. And that has led to you know, seven to 10 different ventures, digital ventures that we've launched all around broadening the value chain around shelter facilitation. So, you know, we used to say we were in the car lending business. We we're in the mobility facilitation business. Well, what does that mean? Well, redefine the value chain around mobility facilitation because people don't necessarily want to own that asset on their balance sheet anymore. So I think from that perspective, one of the things that I've always done and I did earlier in my career is I, I put down what the value proposition was today and what we were offering consumers. And I said, what's the exact opposite of that? 
and rethink entirely the value chain. And you know, where I learned that was at Waterloo in, in systems design and how to put systems together, how to take them apart and how to recombine them. And I think for you as a, as a new generation coming in, there's never been a greater opportunity to rebuild systems from a very different vision of what they can be. That's, that's wonderful. And, and I really take the advice of setting bold objectives, not only being the best in, in our country, but being the best in the world is, is certainly um, wonderful advice, which, which leads very nicely to my last question for you, Dave. Uh, you've not only spoken about setting, setting big goals, big, bold goals, uh, but in the past, and, and to me as well, you've, you've said uh, that it's important that we ourselves define what, what, what's important and not let anyone else define that for us. So tell me, how, how did you find your, your purpose and, and what advice do you have for us in, in finding that? It's hard to just sit down and, you know, the purpose will pop into your head. Probably not. For some, it might, that you have a vision and a, a, of what success looks like. You can tell from my previous comments, I always start with the end in mind. And sometimes it's good to say, what does success look like at the end of a particular role? If you're going to be there three years or five years. But at every step of stage of your life, it's probably a useful exercise to sit down and say, if I were 100 years old, what would I like the story to look like? And start dreaming of what the story, because when you start doing that, then, then there's a deep, powerful subconscious within you that will start to make it happen. So now that may be a great exercise for you to do if you have time over the summer before you become engaged in the economy or you're waiting for your job to start, because many have been deferred for a short period of time, to just start dreaming about if I were to write the story at 100 years old today, what would I like it to look at? Because if you don't put it down, then probably won't happen. Um, second thing is, though, don't be paralyzed by that. Just, I used to say, get on the road. Dream big, but get on the road. Just start. Start somewhere. Because what the one thing you'll know, you'll set these objectives and you think there's a path and the path will be completely different. So just start. You know, it, be creative, try new things, learn, pivot where you have to, and, and enjoy the journey at the end of the day. So for me, my purpose really came to the forefront. I started working with youth as my first job. I mean, when I mowed lawns, I delivered newspapers, which are you know, kind of both skills I don't think kids do anymore, <laughs> but I needed money. And uh, I, I did those things. Um, got up at six every morning and delivered the Montreal Gazette to about 50 homes and had a you know, bowl of cereal and off to school every day. So, you know, it taught me the, the value of money and, and hard work. But my, my first real job after that was working for the YMCA and I worked with young people. I taught water, water polo coach. I was a swim team coach. I lifeguarded. I worked with youth all the time. And as I, as I had my own family, my kids got involved in sports. I coached those sports particularly hockey and basketball. And you know, that kind of led me you know, just to, to view that one, you know, one of the you know, purposes for me is to really help young people thrive, be successful. And that's become kind of the core focus of RBC. I'm very fortunate to have the power of RBC behind that belief that you know, really helping you succeed from a skills perspective, from a job opportunity perspective. It, we put $50 million aside to to make a better world for youth in our country. And I think that's a significant commitment. And uh, you know, we're, we're living out that commitment today in a number of areas and why I'm chairing Business Higher Education Roundtable. So for me, you know, one of the purposes and focus I've had has been on youth since early days. And I think that's you know, my way of, uh, of paying it forward and, and leaving the world in a little bit better place and making sure the next generation is ready to, to do better than we did. This, this is a class of, of, of dreamers whose hustle and, and grit will certainly you know, be, be the right mentality to, to truly put into action your, your words of advice. So, so thank you, Dave. Thank you, thank you so much for your time as well. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, our virtual guests and uh, uh, the class of 2020 for, for joining us today. But before we conclude, uh, we, have a, we have a short one minute video uh, to wrap up by our, one of our great alumnus, Sid Senegarin, who's the CFO at Oscar Health in New York City. 
So thank you again for joining us and congratulations to the graduating class. Congratulations to the University of Waterloo Math Class of 2020. I'm Sid Sankran. I graduated 21 years ago from Waterloo Math. Uh, I've been fortunate to do a lot of interesting things in my career. Um, some of them most recently, I was the Chief Risk Officer and Chief Financial Officer of AIG after the financial crisis. And most recently, I'm the CFO of Oscar Health, a consumer-focused insure tech based in New York. I spent the first 30 days of the pandemic locked down, but I thought of Waterloo a lot because I got a chance to spend time on Zoom calls and Zoom cocktails with many of my old friends from Waterloo. Uh, it reminded me of a tremendous sense of community that I felt there, and I hope that you feel today, even though you're not all together. You know, the last 10 days I've actually been in Canada and watching on television, it did remind me that there are things, um, while many of us at Waterloo were able to do and do interesting careers and create opportunities for our families. Um, a lot of what's going on on television at home in New York has just reminded me there that we didn't accomplish real change. And I hope that you as a group also find time beyond your professional careers to tackle some of the problems around social injustice and racism that are obviously pretty evident in our society. Uh, I wish you the best and, um, and encourage you to focus on things such as that, as well as um, work. And um, with that, good luck and please stay in touch.